history of Uganda, 1894 to 1962. My father used to tell us stories about civil war that had been fought even before we became colonies of the Imperial British government. His grandfather, Okelo Lagere, died in Bunyoro. He was on official duty for a Cholly chieftain. The coup that rocked Africa after independence is not something new. Coup had been happening even before the colonial masters set foot in Uganda. My great grandfather. Okelo Lagere died in Bunyoro and he was buried in Bunyoro by Kabalega of Bunyoro. On the 18th of June 1894, Uganda became a British protectorate. Lord Rosebery made the declaration that came five months after the death of General Porter. The Uganda Protectorate territory was then extended beyond the border of Buganda to areas now known as Uganda. We were under the protection of the British Empire throughout 1894 to 1962. In 1893, the Imperial British East Africa Company transferred its administration rights of territory, mainly of the kingdom of Buganda to the British government. In the mid-1880, the kingdom of Uganda was divided between four religious fractions, Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, and Uganda native religion. Each of the four groups vying for political control. In 1888, Mwanga II was overthrown in a coup led by Muslim fraction and they installed Kalema as the leader. The following year, Protestant and Catholic coalition removed Kalema and returned Mwanga II to power. They secured alliance with the Imperial British East Africa Company and they succeeded in removing Kalema and reinstating Mwanga II. In 1890, as I said before, a long walk to freedom started a long time back. The Protestants and the Catholics were involved in a struggle 
were involved in a struggle for supremacy, which led to the Civil War. The Uganda Agreement of 1900 solidified the power of Protestant Bakunga, client chief, led by Kagwa. London sent only few officials to administer the country. They were relying on the Bakingo ships. We all know that at that moment of time, there, was, there were discontents among the Baganda rank and fire, which weakened the position of their leader. In 1912, Kagwa moved to solidify Bakungu power for Buganda by proposing a second Lukiko for Buganda with himself as the president and the Bakungu as hereditary aristocracy. British officials vetoed that move, that idea, when they discover widespread popular opposition and they decided to bring in some reform measures. The struggle you see today in Uganda has a long history. And sometimes it's better to go back and understand the meaning of a long walk to freedom in order to steer the future. If we want to steer the future, it is better for our new generation to go back and take a look once again at our history, to know what did happen and how it happened. We may consider the military coup of 1971 as the only military coup that started in Uganda. But that is not true. The coup started even before we became colonies. That is to say, scramble for Africa started a long time back. As I said before, the power of local African kings gave the British approval. The power, that is when Harry Johnson in 1899 was appointed as a seasonal administrator, making him a special commissioner to Uganda because he was a player who knows how to play the game of African kings. African kings thought they were playing important role in working with the colonial masters. He believed that the power of the local African king was the only way to succeed. He was convinced that control should be exercised through the African kings. Buganda became the most powerful player in the scramble for Africa. He managed to convince the king of Buganda 
and the policy of Ari Johnson became effective with the Buganda Agreement of 1900. That is when you can realize that the relationship between the Buganda and the British was powerful. They all agreed that Kabaka's status is recognized by Britain and he became the authority of his chief. The chiefs collectively approved the British protectorate over the region. Johnson acknowledged the freehold right to their land. Harry Johnson made similar agreement with rulers of Toro and Kole, and he developed a protectorate policy that had a clear cut between Uganda and Kenya. A game of chess was complete. Johnson at that time realized that Uganda was not suitable for European settlement. He realized that the Pearl of Africa had people who are not very good in taking orders. Outside the Buganda Kingdom, a lot of people disagree with Johnson and press a builder to allow the establishment of European farms and plantation. Another commission during the year before the First World War made it a point of principle that Uganda is to be an African state. They saw that the economy of the protectorate support its policy. Uganda was growing cotton that was produced by the British, which did achieve a great success by African peasant farmers. They also realized that the semi-federal of semi-independence monarchies proved less appropriate in the years after the Second World War. They knew that soon or later, most African countries would be moving toward independence because they knew that young educated Africans are likely leaders of the future. That they knew. By the early 1960, the leading Uganda politician, Milton Obote, founder of Uganda People Congress, of a party drawing its support from northern region, west, its main political opponent was the Kingdom of Buganda. That is when things started falling apart. We took the risk. We chewed it. Spoiled it. And believe me, the blood of innocent Uganda started flowing. 
in River Nile. British then decided to grant Uganda full internal self-government in March 1962. And the following month, Obote was elected as Prime Minister of Uganda. He negotiated the terms of the Constitution and Uganda became independent in October 1962. Confronted with the problem of Buganda, he accepted a constitution allowing federal status and a degree of autonomy to four traditional kingdoms of which Buganda was the most powerful. After the election of 1963, Kabaka Mutesa, the second, became the president. A short-lived collaboration, the marriage between Obote and Kabaka came to an end. As Obote and his first, led by his newly appointed army commander-in-chief, General Idi Amin Dada, attacked Kabaka's palace. Mutesa flees to exile in Britain. A new constitution was put in place, abolishing the kingdom, allowing him to become the president of Uganda. My father used to say, what goes around, come around. In 1971, Amin overthrew his regime. I used to hear those stories at one o, the fireplace. And I now realize that we have Ugandan who does not understand the importance of knowledge from birth. My father used to say, my son, you may have as many degrees as you wish to, but if you don't have that knowledge, if you don't have the cultural knowledge, if you don't have the traditional knowledge, if you don't have ears to hear, those degrees of use will be useless. Those degrees of use will be useless. And you can see today, what we did to our economy. You can see today, where we are going, we are in a state where our kids, our youth, our people are being brutally tortured, murdered, and sometimes we just cry out loud for a few hours and then we go back to 
the new normal. Look at our economy. We may think we are moving ahead, but instead we are moving backward. Because we have this group of people who think they are better. It is time we change our mindset and start thinking seriously about Uganda, about our history, about our culture, about our tradition, about our people. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe.